Um, just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and the elders from other communities who may be here today. So today's speaker is uh, Clara Lynn, um, who I've had the privilege of supervising with Alan Cowman over the last three years of her PhD. And, um, Alan normally would have introduced her, but couldn't be here today, unfortunately. He had to fly to Queensland for a funeral. So it fell on my behalf at the last minute to step into his big shoes. And um, of course, the first thing you have to do when you're introducing someone as a PhD student is find out some dirt on them. <laughs> the problem is, it seems that Clara's well, too well liked within the lab, because the, worst, the best I could get for Clara, the best dirt I could get, was that she's a mean marimba player. <laughs> Now, for those of you who don't know, like myself, Philistines like myself, what a marimba is, fortunately, Clara has a nice YouTube video <laughs> of her playing in a competition. I thought I'd make nice background music while I, t while I tell you what Alan had uh, asked me to say on his behalf. Really? Is that better? Yeah. All right. Um, so, Clara... <laughs> Clara uh, joined Alan's lab back in 2009 as a Europe student and then worked with her as an RA uh, for a couple of years before, um, uh, during which time she became an excellent protein chemist. Now she did her honours uh, uh, after a bit of time as an RA, which, uh, where she was involved with solving crystal structure of malaria protein that binds to uh, red blood cells. And she'll mention that in today's talk as well. So she started a PhD as a very experienced protein chemist and she took on a, a tough challenge of working on structure and function of proteins that present on the, malaria, uh, on the malaria form that invades the red blood cells, the MSP1 complexes. And from this work, she's got a, a JBC, first author JBC that we published um, last year and then we're writing up the second half of her work which is, makes up the, the majority of her, uh, her um, presentation today, and we're hoping to submit that to eLife in the near future. So just a bit on the, the, what she's been working on. Whilst the identity of the proteins that are present on the surface of the invasive merozoite form have been known for a long time, little is known about their organisation and structure on this cell or their overall function. And that's really what Clara's been working on um, during, uh, has made some major inroads during her work here as a point on PhD. So, from my behalf, not only is she a mean marimba player, but she's a talented musician, but she's also a fantastic science, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome her to come and give her a talk today. Thank you. Let me get that, get rid of that really quickly. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thank you, Peter. I'll now actually talk a little bit more about science. Um, so I've been working on merozoite surface proteins, and these are proteins found on the surface of the malaria parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. Um, so I'll start by talking a little bit about malaria. Um, so the malaria life cycle is quite complicated in the sense that it involves both the human host as well as the mosquito vector. And um, it's only in the asexual blood stage where we get the clinical symptoms associated with malaria. So during the asexual blood stage, merozoites, which are the invasive form of the parasite, will invade red blood cells. And this starts a 48-hour life cycle going through the ring stage Thrifozoite stage and finally the schizon stage. And in the schizon stage, a final mature schizon will give rise to between 16 and 32 daughter merozoites. These merozoites will egress from the red blood cell, which then goes on to reinvade new red cells. And it's really this repeated invasion cycle that causes all the sim clinical symptoms associated with malaria. So central to the blood stage is the invasion process. And what I'll show you now is a video um, of mer merozoites invading red blood cells. So We've got red blood cells over here, and then we've got the tiny little circles which are merozoites. So if we focus on this red cell over here, a parasite will come into contact with the red cell, which is called the initial attachment stage, and then it will reorientate. And when it's um, decided that this is the red cell it's going to invade, it will start the process of active invasion where it pushes its way into the red blood cell. So ac when active invasion is done, the parasite's in the red cell, and the parasite will then reseal the red cell, um, and this completes invasion. So as you can see, the invasion process is really quick. It takes less than a minute for a merozoite to successfully invade a red blood cell. Um, and the details of invasion has been looked at in more detail in using electron microscopy. 
So like I mentioned, the merozoite was first come into contact with the red blood cell. This causes the red cell to deform, and, and that's through mechanisms that we don't really understand. Um, the parasite will then reorientate itself so the epical end is in contact with the red cell. This is really quite important because at the epical end of the parasite, there are um, organelles, and which are these electron-dense circles over here. So once it's committed to invading a red cell, ligands from these organelles will be released, a tight junction is formed, and then the parasite starts to invade a red cell. And in the process of doing so, it forms a vacuole around the parasite. Um, and this vacuole is called the parasitophorus vacuole, which the parasite will sit within throughout the ase asexual blood stage. So once it's completely within the red cell, it will reseal the red cell, and this completes the invasion process. So what I'm particularly interested in is um, the initial attachment stage of the parasite to red cells. And this is thought to be mediated through merozoite surface proteins, or MSPs. Um, so the two classes of MSPs, the first of which are MSPs that are GPI anchored to the parasite surface. Um, and a few examples of these are MSP1, MSP2, MSP4, and MSP10. So they're found directly on the parasite surface. And then we've got a second class of proteins, um, the peripherally associating merozoite surface proteins. And these proteins don't have a GPI anchor or a transmembrane domain. So in order for them to be presented on the surface, they have to interact with something else. And a few examples of these Proteins are MSP3, MSP6, MSPDL1, MSPDL2, as well as MSP7. So merozoite surface proteins are found on the on the surface of parasites. So if we look at um, an IFA of a shizon over here, you can see that MSP1 is localized along the periphery of um, merozoites. Each little circle over here represents a single daughter merozoites in a shizon. And again, with the peripherally associating merozoite surface proteins, it's also localized on the surface. All right, so I'll now move on to talk a little bit about the proteins I'll be um, talking about in more detail later, and the first of which is merozoite surface protein 1, or MSP1. Um, MSP1 is the most abundant merozoite surface protein. It also has a GPI anchor, so it's anchored directly to the parasite surface. It's a very large protein. It's between 190 to 210 kilodaltons, and it's proteolytically cleaved by a subtilizing light protease called PF sub 1. So each arrow over here indicates a processing event that happens during schizogony, and we end up with four different fragments, the P42, P38, P30, and P83 fragments. And these fragments are held together non-covalently on the parasite surface. MSP1 is an essential protein. To date, we haven't been able to successfully knock it out. Um, and in terms of the structural understanding of this protein, we've got a high-resolution structure to the 19 kilodalton domain in the C-terminal N, but for the rest of the molecule, we, we don't quite understand how it looks like. And in terms of function, we know that MSP1 um, is involved in binding to other merozoite surface proteins. All right, so we'll move on to the peripheral MSPs, and I'll describe this this, these proteins as a, as a class. Um, so peripheral MSPs, like I mentioned before, don't have a GPI anchor or transmembrane domain. So in order for them to be presented on the parasite surface, they have to interact with something else. We also have some idea that they are functionally redundant because we're able to delete each of these um, genes and there's no effect on parasite viability. Um, out of the five proteins, we know that MSPDL1 and MSPDL2 are functional molecules. They're able to bind to red blood cells. Um, but for MSP3, MSP6, and MSP7, we currently don't quite know what, what they're doing in evasion. All right, so MSPs themselves present um, themselves as attractive vaccine candidates. And the reason for that is because they're exposed to the host immune system. So when the parasite gets released into the bloodstream, um, the host can mount an immune response to these proteins that are on the surface. Um, and there are more and more studies that have been showing that um, naturally acquired antibodies against MSPs are protective against subsequent infections of malaria. So for that reason, a couple of MSPs have been evaluated in vaccine trials, um, including two fragments of MSP1, the P19 and P42 fragments, as well as MSP3. So MSPs have always shown potential in in vitro assays, but when we look at vaccine trials, they've really had somewhat of a uh, limitation. 
Um, so what do we know about protein-protein interactions on the merozite surface? So quite a few years ago, um, MSP6 and MSP7 were both found to be interacting partners of MSP1. And quite a few years later, um, the, the concept or the idea that MSPs can come together to form a large macromolecular complex is described in this paper. All right. So this leads me to the aims of my PhD. I've been really interested in merozite surface proteins and how they actually form complexes on the parasite surface. So I split my talk into two parts, the first part of which I'll be looking at um, merozite surface protein complexes and trying to identify which ones are actually functionally important. And then the second part of my talk, I'll be using one particular complex to show you how we're trying to figure out protein-protein interactions that occur within, within a single complex. All right, so today I'll be um, talking about six different proteins, and it will be a little bit complicated if you try to remember all of them by name. So I'm going to give you an analogy, and my analogy involves an ice cream. So MSP1 is like the core of your complex, so it's like the cone of your ice cream. You need a base for everything to come on top of it, so that's your MSP1 over here. And then we've got MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2, which is like your ice cream, your strawberry flavored, vanilla flavored, whatever flavor you like. Um, and these are functional molecules. So these are molecules that bind to red blood cells. And then we've got the rest over here, the MSP3, MSP6, and MSP7 molecules. Currently, we don't know what they do in invasion. So we're going to call them accessory proteins, and I'll liken them to be your toppings. So your hundreds and thousands, chocolate chips, and nuts, and whatsoever. So I'll try my best to color code them through the talk. So if you do get lost, remember that MSP1 is like the core, it's like the cone of your ice cream. MSP DVL1 and 2 will be in pink, that's like your ice cream, and then the rest of it will be in gold, and that's your toppings. All right. So now I'll start with the first part of my talk, and that's to try and figure out a little bit more about these complexes. Um, and so we had a few questions that we wanted to answer. The first of which is, we've got peripheral MSPs. They don't have a GPI anchor or a transmembrane domain, so they have to interact with something. And what is this something that they're interacting with? The second question, are there different MSP complexes on the parasite surface, or is there one big complex which everything binds to, which then mediates initial attachment during invasion? And lastly, what is their functional role in invasion? So I'll try and put together everything we know about merozoite surface proteins in relation to um, the invasion process. So during the initial contact and reorientation stage, the parasite um, will, will bind to red cell and reorientate. And what happens to the MSPs are they're presented on the surface as a complex. And they will then interact with an erythrocyte receptor. <laughs> All right. So once they've in, in, interacted with the erythrocyte receptor, they then disengage through an unknown mechanism at the moment. And then we move on to the active invasion stage where the parasite burrows into red cell and the surface coat is being shed. So when this happens, a protease called PF sub 2 or PF sub 2 larsen 2 will come along the surface and clip these complexes off. And what we're left with is a 19 kilodalton fragment that gets um, internalized into the red blood cell or the bulk of the complex that gets shed into the bloodstream. So this complex over here is what we're particularly interested in. Um, and from this point on, every time I talk about invasion complexes or invasion supernatant, I'm talking about complexes that have been shed into the, into the bloodstream post-invasion. And the reason why we're actually using these shed complexes is because merozoite surface proteins are processed extensively during schizogony. Um, so these are the six proteins that I'm looking at, and every arrow indicates a processing event that has to happen during schizogony. As you can see, for many of these proteins, processing occurs more than once, and we know that these processing events occurs right up to the point of invasion. And it's only in the invasion supernatant where we're able to find the mature forms of these proteins. So MSP1 is found as four different fragments, and then the rest of the peripheral proteins, we've got a single band which correspond to um, the final mature product of these proteins. More importantly, these um, mature products actually represent complexes that have been functional during invasion. So we've got our um, material. So we wanted to figure out if our peripheral proteins, what our peripheral proteins were actually binding to on the parasite surface. Um, like I mentioned before, MSP1 is the most abundant protein on the parasite surface. So that was the first thing we looked at, whether these peripheral proteins were actually binding to MSP1. 
So we IP'd with an NT-MSP1 antibody and pulled down MSP1. Along with it, we also pulled down MSP3, MSP6, MSP DVL1, MSP DVL2, and MSP7. So all the peripheral proteins appear to be binding to MSP1. Um, this is in contrast to MA1. So MA1 is another invasion ligand that functions downstream of um, initial attachment, and MA1 doesn't bind to MSP1. So we have an idea that all these peripheral MSPs bind to MSP1. Um, what we then saw was a slightly different profile when we immunoprecipitate it with the peripheral MSPs. So for example, if we immunoprecipitate with MSP6, we get MSP1 and MSP6 coming down, but MSP3, MSP DVL1, MSP DVL2, and MSP7 don't come down with it. Um, and similarly, when we IP with either MSP DVL1 or MSP DVL2, we got MSP1 coming down and either MSP DVL1 or MSP DVL2 coming down, but again, none of the other peripheral proteins are coming down. So what this is telling us is that, yes, the peripheral proteins are binding to MSP1, but they appear to be binding to MSP1 in different complexes. So I looked at that in a little bit more detail um, and decided to separate out these invasion complexes by size. So what you're looking at over here is a size exclusion chromatogram of um, separated invasion complexes and the western blots that correspond to the fractions under the peak. Um, so MSP1, consistent with our hypothesis that it is the core of these complexes, is found to elute across the entire length of the, the column. Um, then quite interestingly, the peripheral proteins actually come out at different points um, in the column. So as an example, um, big things will always come out first in a size exclusion, um, uh, using size exclusion chromatography. So MSP DVL1 over here would represent complexes that are really, really big. And then we've got the mid-size complexes um, that include the MSP3, MSP6, and MSP7 complexes. And then we've also got MSP DVL2, which would represent complexes that are somewhat smaller. So, of course, with this, we needed to confirm that our proteins were actually in the form of a complex. So, amino precipitated each of these fractions with an MSP1 antibody. Um, we could pull down MSP1, and along with it, we also saw our peripheral proteins come down. And what this is telling us is that MSP3, MSP6, MSP DVL1, MSP DVL2, and MSP7 are all in complex with MSP1. So as an estimation of, of how big these complexes would be, um, we, we used a molecular weight standard to try and figure this out. Um, and if we look at the extreme end of the column, which is the smallest complex, the MSP DVL2 complex sits around 150 kilodaltons. And then if we go to the other end, MSP DVL1 is um, the MSP DVL1 complex is around the megadalton size. So there's quite a big spread of, of um, the sizes of these complexes. So, so far, um, I've talked about the fact that peripheral MSPs interact with MSP1 and they form different complexes on the parasite surface. So, now that we have a little bit of an idea of what, what they are, um, we we're keen to figure out what their functional role might be in invasion. So, um, if you recall, I talked about the fact that MSPs are involved in initial attachment. And if that's the case, then these complexes should, be, should have some capacity in binding to red blood cells. And so that's what we, we did. Um, this is a red cell binding assay that we do quite routinely in the lab. So very briefly, um, we basically incubate our invasion complexes with red blood cells and then pass the mixture through oil. So because of the density of the red cells, complexes that, that have that are bound to the red blood cells will sediment to the bottom, and anything that's unbound will sit on top of the oil layer. So remove the top two oil layer and then elute our invasion complexes at a high salt concentration and look at um, what we see on a western blot. So interestingly, we, we actually saw two different phenotypes. We saw um, complexes that were able to bind to red blood cells as we expected. So there are three complexes that we identified to bind to red cells, the MSP6, MSP DVL1, and MSP DVL2 complexes. But there were also two complexes that did not seem to bind to red blood cells, and these are the MSP3 and MSP7 complexes. At the present moment, we're not quite sure what these complexes might be doing in terms of invasion, and it's obviously something that we'll be keen to pursue in the future. But in any case, we've got these three complexes over here. We're keen to try and figure out a little bit more about these complexes. And mainly, what is the binding component within these complexes that's able to mediate the binding of the parasite to the red cells? Um, in order to do that, 
we expressed and purified recombinant merozoite surface protein. So I brought this slide up briefly before to show you that to show you that MSPs get processed. Um, and so each of these recombinant proteins will meet to the mature form of the proteins that are found in the complexes. So we've got a Kamasi stain of the final purified products. These are proteins made in E. coli. Um, MSP1 is a little bit of an interesting one because MSP1, like I mentioned, is really, really big. It's 190 kilodaltons, and it was not possible to make the entire molecule as one fragment. So our collaborators ended up making two bits of MSP1, the P83, P30 fragment, and the P38 and P42 fragment, which they put together to form a heterodimer, which is why in our Kamasi stain gel we get two bands. With the peripheral proteins, we've got MSP3. MSP3 um, in the parasite supernatin is found as a 44 kilodalton fragment, which we expressed. MSP6 is a 36 kilodalton fragment. MSP DVL1, 75 kilodaltons. MSP DVL2, 85 kilodaltons. And MSP7, the final process form of MSP7 is a 22 kilodalton fragment, uh, which we managed to make as well. So I mentioned previously that um, humans who've been exposed to malaria will will acquire antibodies against this, these MSPs. So we're keen to see whether our recombinant proteins were detected by human immune sera as well. And indeed, um, our recombinant proteins could be detected by naturally acquired antibodies. All right, so now we looked at which of these recombinant proteins were able to bind to red blood cells. And immediately, you'll be able to see that only two out of the six um, merozoite surface proteins are able to bind directly to red blood cells, and these are MSP developed 1 and MSP developed 2. Um, we've used PFRH4.9 as a control over here, so RH4 binds to complement receptor 1 on the, on the red blood cell surface. So we then confirmed that MSP developed 1 and MSP developed 2 are the binders through another red cell binding assay. So just very briefly, we incubate our recombinant protein with red cells. Um, instead of putting it through oil, we'll now detect it with um, antibodies specific to the antigen and um, label with a fluorophore, which we can detect with flow cytometry. So again, we see MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2 able to bind to red blood cells um, and as, as compared to RH4, which is our positive control over here. So what this means is that MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2 are the functional molecules within these complexes. They are what mediates the interaction between the parasite surface and the red blood cell surface. So we've got two of these molecules, but I mentioned that there was a third complex that's able to bind to red blood cells as well. And these, this complex is a complex that contains MSP6. And if we look at the recombinant MSP6, you notice that MSP6 itself is not able to bind to red blood cells. And what this is telling us is that there's um, possibly another component in this complex that we haven't quite figured out. Um, but what we do know is that this component is not MSP DVL1 or MSP DVL2, because if you recall our IP with MSP6, um, MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2 don't actually come down with it. All right, so, so far, what, what we know is that we've got at least three complexes that can bind to the red blood cells. For two of them, we've identified um, the binding component, so that's MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2. But interestingly, we've got a third complex out there that also binds to red cells. Um, we know that it contains MSP6, but the component that binds to red cell we haven't quite figured out at the moment. So now that we know that, what would happen if we try and block these complexes? What if we try to disrupt the functionally important these com uh, these functionally important complexes? So when Alex was still um, working on merozoite surface proteins, he made a whole bunch of uh, gene knockouts of merozoite surface proteins. And this, these include single gene deletions of MSP3, MSP6, MSP DVL1, and MSP DVL2. And what he found was that knocking out these proteins individually had no effect on parasite viability. So even without, um, even when the parasite doesn't express each of these proteins, it's quite happy to, to live normally. And what I found subsequently with my IPs is the fact that um, even when we knock out one particular complex, there are other complexes on the surface that are not disrupted. So if we look at this IP over here, we've got wild-type parasite, and then we've got each of the knockout lines corresponding to an MSP3, MSP6, MSP DVL1, and MSP DVL2 knockout. So um, if we use MSP DVL2 as an example, when we knock MSP DVL2 out, obviously that complex is not on the surface anymore. Um, but 
the MSP DVL1, MSP6, and MSP proteins co-immunoprecipitate with MSP1, so these complexes are still present on the parasite surface. Likewise, with the other three knockouts, the protein that we've knocked out is not being expressed, but the remaining um, proteins are able to co-immunoprecipitate with MSP1. And what does this mean in terms of function? What does it mean in terms of the ability of these complexes to bind to red blood cells? So if we look at, um, this is a red blood cell binding assay, um, and if we look at knocking out MSP DVL2, that complex is no longer present, so that complex doesn't bind to red cells, but the MSP DVL1 and MSP6 complexes are still there and are still able to bind to red cells. Likewise, if we knock out MSP DVL1, that, that complex is not being expressed, but the MSP6 and MSP DVL2 complexes are still able to bind to red cells. Again, if we knock out MSP6, MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2 can compensate for the loss of this complex over here. So we've got multiple complexes that do the same thing. And, and this whole issue of functional redundancy becomes incredibly evident when we start to look at in vitro assays um, using parasites. So one of the things that we do in the lab is to assay for um, the importance of an antigen um, by adding antibodies to block that antigen. So if we, in this case, I've added um, antibodies against msp dbl one to our parasite cultures, um, to, and, and so this complex over here would be blocked. Um, but what we ended up seeing is that, yes, we got about 40% inhibition in growth at a, about a mg per mil, but um, we're not able to completely block um, invasion or parasite growth. And what this is telling us is that there are possibly other complexes out there that's um, compensating for the loss of this complex over here. So what would happen if we tried to knock out two complexes this time? So I've used a MSP DVL2 knockout line so that that line doesn't actually express this complex, and then added the antibodies against MSP DVL1 to this parasite line, which is in black over here. We possibly see a little bit more of inhibition, but again, we're not able to completely block invasion. And what this points to is at least another complex out there that's able to compensate for the loss of these two complexes. So um, I'm going to summarize what I've talked about in the first part of my talk. So, so far I've shown you that MSP1 is like a platform, so peripheral MSPs um, that need to bind to a protein will bind to MSP1. And for the first time, we've able to show the complexity of the parasite surface. We now know that the different forms of MSP1 complexes present, and these complexes range quite significantly in sizes. We also know that at least three complexes are able to bind to red blood cells. Um, interestingly, we've also got these two complexes over here that don't bind to red blood cells. Um, at this present moment, we don't really have an idea what they might be doing in invasion, but obviously something that, that um, would be of interest for us to pursue, pursue in the future. In terms of the red blood cell binding complexes, we know that um, for two of these complexes, the, the binding protein is MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2. But for the third complex out there, um, we know that it binds, but we don't know what is actually mediating this in interaction. So again, this is, this is a complex that we're quite interested to figure out a little bit more about. All right, so lastly, I've also shown you that these complexes that bind to red cells are functionally redundant. So even when we knock out the functionally important molecules, um, that doesn't seem to have very much of an effect in terms of the parasite's ability to utilize another um, complex to, to facilitate invasion. All right, so um, I'll move on to the second part of my talk. And this part of my talk is focused on trying to figure out protein-protein interactions that occur within complexes. So I've shown you today that there are quite a few complexes on the parasite surface, and unfortunately, um, I won't have time to go through every single one of them. So I'm going to use this complex over here as an example, and this is the MSP1, MSP DVL1 complex. Um, and a few questions that we'd like to answer. The first of which is whether there's specificity in how MSP1 and MSP DVL1 interact with each other. And then to try and figure out um, regions of functional importance, we're going to look at um, what regions within MSP DVL1 is involved in binding to red blood cells. And then finally, um, we'll look a little bit more into the structural details of this complex. All right, so the first thing we obviously had to do was to show that these two proteins are actually interacting with each other. Um, and I've showed you this, this Kamasi stain gel previously. Just to briefly mention again, MSP1 is a heterodimer, so it's made from two different fragments, um, which is why we get two bands on a Kamasi gel. 
And the MSPDBL1 protein is made to the mature form of the protein that's found shed into the parasite supernatant. So um, we've got these two proteins, and we looked at um, whether they interacted with each other. So a couple of different techniques that we use. Um, firstly, a co-IP co where we incubated MSP1 with MSPDBL1, and then um, immunoprecipitated either with an MSP1 or msp 1 antibody. As you can see, both proteins are coming down with each other, and this indicates to us that um, these two proteins are binding to each other. We also confirmed that with an ELISA assay, so in this case I've um, put uh, MSP1, incubated MSP1 with msp 1 and again we see, we see binding of these two proteins. So the last method um, we used was surface plasmon resonance, or SPR. So we're keen to try and understand a little bit more about the kinetics of this interaction. So we've got MSP1 um, coupled to a chip, and then we allowed msp dbl one to flow onto the chip. So any detection of um, de any detection of binding is seen in an increase in the y-axis with the res resonance, um, and so this. Sensor ground over here is telling us that MSP DVL1 is binding to MSP1. And from this, we are able to derive a binding affinity. And so MSP DVL1 and MSP1 is interacting in around 170 nanomolar. So as a reference, um, protein-protein interactions generally sit between a nanomolar to micromolar range. And for two large proteins, 170 nanomolars would represent quite a good interaction. All right, so we know these two proteins bind to each other. Um, so now to look at whether there's specificity in, in the domains which bind to each other. So MSP1, I mentioned quite a few times now, is proteolytically cleaved into four different fragments. And we made each of these fragments individually. Um, we've got a Kamasi stain of the purified products over here. Again, these proteins are made in E. coli. And then... Um, we float these, each of these fragments over msp dbl one to see if we could see any binding. And um, quite obviously, we, we only see three fragments that are able to bind to msp dbl one and these are the P42, P38, and P83 fragments of MSP1. Um, quite striking is the, is the binding affinity of these fragments to MSP1, uh, msp dbl one sorry. So if you recall, full-length MSP1 and msp dbl one um, interacted around 170 nanomolar. But if we look at each of these fragments, we're starting to go into the micromolar range. So the, the binding affinity is somewhat weaker when we look at um, each of these fragments individually. And what this is telling us is that all of these fragments over here that are binding is actually um, contributing to the overall affinity or stability between the msp dbl one and msp one interaction. All right, so we know now um, a little bit more about how this complex looks on the parasite surface. We'll now move on to the red blood cell surface end, uh, end and try and figure out which regions within msp dbl one is mediating this um, binding. So just a little bit of background about msp dbl one msp dbl one is a 75 kilodalton protein, and it has two adhesive domains. It's got the DBL domain in the internal, N terminus, as well as the spam and leucine like zipper motif in the C terminus. Um, so the DVL domain is found classically in two classes of protein, the first of which is the EBA family. So in Plasmodium falciparum, we've got EBA 140, EBA 175, EBA, and EBA 181. And in Plasmodium vivax, we've got the Duffy binding protein. The DVL uh, DVL domains within these proteins function to bind to erythrocyte receptors. And in the second class of proteins, which is the PFEMP1 protein, um, DBL domains in this protein are involved in cytoadherence and antigenic variation. So quite a few years ago, we solved the structure of the DBL, DBL domain of MSP DBL2. Um, and what you're looking at over here is that domain overlaid with either um, EBA 175 DBL domain or the PFMP1 DBL domain. And immediately you'll be able to see that the core structure of this um, DBL domain is conserved amongst um, the different protein, different classes of proteins. Um, and DBL domains are unique to Plasmodia. So um, Plasmodium is the only organism that expresses these DBL domains. So if we move on to the C-terminal end, we've got the spam domain as well as the leucine-like zipper motif. And this is a region that's highly conserved in um, a multi-gene family. And um, members of this multi-gene family includes MSP3, MSP6, MSP-DVL2, H101, 103, as well as MSP-DVL1. 
So the SPAM domain is a very acidic rich region, and this domain is involved in protein-protein interactions. And the leucine like zipper motif um, allows the molecule to oligomerize. And more importantly, for at least for MSP6, it's been shown that if you truncate this leucine like zipper motif, the molecule is not able to oligomerize, and the mo monomeric form of this molecule is not able to bind to its interacting partners. All right, so with that in mind, we made a couple of different constructs. So we've got the full-length protein that contains the DVL domain, SPAM domain, as well as the lysine light zipper motif. We've also made just the DVL domain, the SPAM domain and lysine light zipper motif, as well as the SPAM-only construct. So again, you're looking at uh, Kamasi stain of the purified products that were made in E. coli. We then put each of these constructs into a red blood cell binding assay that I described to you previously. Um, and so, like what we saw previously, the full-length protein was able to bind to red blood cells. Um, and this full-length protein obviously contains both the DVL domain, span domain, and lucid light zipper motif. And very much like um, the rest of the DVL domains that have, that have been described so far, the DVL domain of MSP DVL1 was also able to bind to red cells. Um, and but what was quite surprising in, in our result was the fact that the spam and leucine like zipper construct that we made was also able to bind to red blood cells. So we've always thought that the spam domain, which is the region that's involved in protein protein interactions, might be found tucked away within a complex and therefore might not be accessible to um, red blood cells. But this is telling us otherwise. We're not quite sure yet. We're still trying to confirm whether this binding might be physiologically relevant. But if it is, then we know that um, the oligomeric state of this, this construct over here is quite important. Because if we truncate the leucine like zipper motif, this protein is no longer able to bind to red blood cells. All right, so we then looked at whether we can block the binding of MSPDVR1 to red blood cells. Um, and the way we did it was to incubate antibodies with our MSPDVR1 and see whether, to see whether we could block the binding to, to red cells. And indeed, with increasing concentrations of antibodies um, incubated with our recombinant protein, we could completely block the binding of MSPDVR1 to red blood cells. All right, so we've learned a little bit more about MSPDVL1 and, and how it may potentially bind to red cells. I guess the really qu interesting question would be, what is the structure of this complex that we're looking at? Um, so throughout my PhD, I've been, I've been trying to crystallize a lot of uh, merozyte surface proteins, different constructs, different um, tags, different, uh, different size MSPs, and I've not been successful at, at all in trying to crystallize them. And so we thought maybe these proteins by themselves are unstable. Maybe need, they need a buddy. Maybe they need their interacting partner. So we moved on to try and express a recombinant complex. But again, we're faced with quite a few difficulties. And, and the main difficulty was, to, was that we were not able to produce a stable um, recombinant complex. So then we thought, you know, what about parasite complexes? These parasites are making these complexes. They're stable and they're functional. So why not try and purify from, from the parasite itself, um, which is what we ended up doing. Uh, so I've got a blue native page over here of a purified complex. So this is the MSP1, MSP DVL1 complex, which we purified from parasites. Um, and consistent with what we saw with the gel uh, size exclusion chromatography, this complex is sitting around megadaltons. So along with Wilson in our lab and um, Eric Hansen at Bar 21, we started to look at these complexes using electron microscopy. Um, so these are neg negative stains of our megadalton large complex um, at two different magnifications. So as you can see on the left over here, each little circle, each little sphere represent a single complex. And the sample is quite homogeneous. Um, and then if we increase the magnification, we'll st we start to see a little bit of structural features in these spheres. So if you look at this particular one over here, you can almost see that within the little bowl, there's, there's a groove that goes in the middle of the molecule. So obviously this is very preliminary work, and we're working now to move on from the step. We've um, looked at it under cryo-EM conditions, and these complexes do quite well. So um, the next stage of this project would be, would be to um, be able to reconstruct this, this complex using single particle cryo-EM. All right, so with that leads me to kind of put together the second part of um, the story. So obviously I haven't been able to show you everything that happens on the surface, but um, I hope that 
just using this complex over here, I've been able to show you what, what we can do with the different, what we can try and understand from the different complexes. So firstly, with the MSP1, 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 MSP DVL1 complex, we now know that MSP DVL1 binds to three of the four fragments of MSP1. We also know that all these fragments um, contribute to the overall binding affinity between the two molecules. Um, and in terms of the red cell end of things, we know that the, the MSP DVL1 molecule bind via both the DVL and spam domain, um, and the binding is dependent on the oligomeric state of the molecule. So currently we're, we're isolating purified complexes for structural studies and this is quite an exciting time for us um, in terms of being able to understand a lot more about um, how this complex actually looks like. All right, so with that it leads me to um, summarize everything that I've talked about today. So um, for the first time we've now been able to show the complexity of of what's happening on the parasite surface. We now know that the different complexes that are present on the parasite surface, um, and these complexes obviously have different functions, the first of which is to bind to erythrocytes, um, which we think would be important in mediating initial attachment. But we've also got these complexes over here. The MSP3 and MSP7 complex are on the surface, um, but we haven't quite figured out what they might be doing in terms of invasion. With our red blood cell binding complexes, um, we've identified the functional molecule within these complexes to be MSP DVL1 and MSP DVL2. But there's obviously a third complex we're, which we're really interested in because this complex is able to bind to red cell through a currently unknown um, protein. I've also shown you that um, MSP1 complexes are functionally redundant. Um, if we knock any one of these out, it doesn't actually impact on the parasite that much because it's able to compensate for the loss with another um, invasion complex. And lastly, um, all right, no? No, all right. Um, and lastly, I've also shown you that um, we, we're looking a lot more into detail as to what happens within these complexes, the protein-protein interactions that occur within these complexes. And together with the high-resolution structure, which we'll hopefully get in the near future, um, we'll be able to get a lot more information about the regions of functional importance within these merozoite surface complexes. So with that, it leads me to thank the people who have been involved in this project. So there's been a huge um, number of collaborations that we've, we've had over the years, um, and this work obviously couldn't have proceeded without, without all the help and support from all these people. So firstly, to my supervisors, Alan and Peter, um, they've been incredibly incredible support through the, through the length of my PhD, and obviously um, given me a lot of help, and, and I've obviously learned a lot from them, so thank you. Um, and then, Everyone in the Kalman lab would have been involved in this project at one point or another. Um, and so I'm very thankful for all the generosity in terms of reagents, technical expertise, help inside and out of the lab. Um, and then Alex, um, Alex has obviously made a whole panel of reagents that I've used and, and I've shown you through, through, the, through my talk. And so, um, and these are reagents that we obviously needed um, to, to follow up on the work. And then the monoclonal facility has been really amazing. They've immunized so many animals and they've also screened so many antibodies for us to um, finally get, get a subset of free agents that we can use for this work. Um, Christian and Herman from Harderburg University have been very, very, very generous with um, the recombinant MSP1 as well as um, reagents to um, the MSP1 molecule, which has really helped us kickstart the whole protein-protein interaction work. And then there's a team both at Bar 21 and La Trobe University um, that have done a lot of biophysical characterization of the merozoite surface protein. So unfortunately, I haven't had time to go through any of that work, but I'd like to thank the team um, from from the teams who have been involved in, in that part of the work as well. So that leads me to also thank, thank Melbourne Uni as well as the Australian government for providing me with scholarships to do my PhD. And so with that, thank you to everyone who's been involved in this project and thank you all for coming today. Clara. Paris. <laughs>
Hey, Carl. Um, just the question about the uh, commercial service protein complexes in different sizes. So what exactly did you put through the size exclusion column? So that was um, unpurified shed complexes. So that is um, complexes that the parasites have. So during invasion, the parasites will invade red cells, and, and these are the complexes that have been shed. And that was the material that we put onto the size and column. So is that just blood culture that you take out and put through the column? That yeah, so we get rid of everything that is, that is human and then and then put that put the rest the supernatant into this complex into the column. Okay. Um, I was wondering, good talk, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering if you've done the you know, black core experiments we had MSP mm -hmm. one or two. I can't remember on the chip. I was wondering if you'd used your different constructs of that on the chip to try and figure out yeah. exactly what binds to these three different components. Yes, I have, which is really complicated, and so I didn't actually have time to um, talk about it, but I'll refer you to my paper in JVC that has all the different constructs binding to all the different MS3.1 constructs. Andreas. So you did some assays for um, uh, invasion into the risk sites where you put in antibodies against MSCP proteins, and then you concluded that these proteins are not absolutely essential for the invasion. But how can you be sure about that? I think not every antibody that binds to a surface protein actually blocks its function. There's plenty of um, proteins um, relevant to, to cancer biology where antibodies um, against EGF receptor, for example, don't actually block it, only some do. So how, how can you be sure? Yeah, definitely. So I've actually split that result into two. Um, and the second part, where it's the recombinant protein with the antibodies, actually show that we're able to block that binding completely to red cells. So if you recall, um, let's try to find that. So if you recall this result over here, we're getting complete bind, uh, blocking. And these were the same antibodies that were put into the, into the culture. So these antibodies are. Um, we think blocking the, the MSPD1 complex. It's a pretty obscene um, concentration for milligrams per mil. Yeah, definitely. I mean, normally block, antibodies block at um, low micromole, uh, low microgram per mil concentration. Yeah, this is a little bit of an interesting assay because we're using recombinant proteins. So obviously, the more recombinant proteins we put in, the more antibodies we'll need to block the, the interaction. So. Um, yeah, I hope this makes a bit of sense in, in terms of why these concentrations are so much higher than what we have to use um, as compared to the growth inhibition assay. Tony? <coughs> the DPL1 binding protein on the erythrocyte, or is it a lipid? You didn't mention the um, there is an indication of what it might be binding to, but um, I haven't. It's it, uh, there are other people in the lab who are who are work, who's working on this, so um, I'm not really um, able to comment on that too much. You don't know. You're not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Both, anyway. Justin. Um, so, Clara, you showed really elegantly that there's clearly different MSP complexes being formed. And what's your working hypothesis? Do you think those different complexes are all binding the same thing, or are they on the, on the red cell, or do you think that they might be binding different red cell receptors? Um, I don't know whether they will be binding different receptors or not. Um, that's obviously work that has to be done to, to try and figure that out. But in terms of initial attachment, the more complexes you have on the parasite surface, the more you'll be able to stick to a red blood cell. So in, in that sense, you know, the parasite, it would be in the favour of the parasite to be able to bind mm. to different receptors on the red blood cell surface. But of course, it's not something we have quite figured out. Yeah, so I wonder, if, just leading on from that, if you could use different enzymatic treatments to test the binding of your complexes, which you've shown do bind to red blood cells in vitro. If you treat them with different enzymes and then measure the binding, if there's any differences? Um, yep, we JVC paper as well. <laughs> Kind of, but anyway. <laughs> um, so we have looked at each of these three complexes um, binding to enzyme-treated red cells, and there's no difference in what they can bind to. So they're all trypsin, carbotrypsin, neuraminidase, and sensitive, um, which is not really 
anything exciting at the moment until we've figured out what they're actually going to. Wait, Sorry, I don't know if you could comment on this idea in the field that um, part of um, the reason for the shedding of the NSD complexes is as an immune decoy mechanism, and that it sort of overwhelms the human immune system to try to figure out how it can make um, inhibitory antibodies. And I was wondering if you could sort of comment on that and how you thought about that as a Um. Yeah, the Im immune decoys have, have been described for quite a while now. And obviously, if you have all these complexes being shed out into the supernate, and then the parasite is kind of being hidden. So in a way, that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure what exactly is your question, but... Uh. Yeah, well, I've just always been, you know, curious about that, because there's a lot of proteins on the surface, and um, and there's a lot of proteins on the surface. Um, and whether through your years of working on it, whether or not really the function of it was uh, binding proteins, or is the balance really that they are just overwhelming the immune response? The interesting part of that is that, so there are quite a few complexes that are expressed in a lot more abundance as compared to others. And so at least for MSPDL2, which is, is a functional complex, that's expressed really, really little in a parasite. As compared to, for example, MSP3, we haven't quite figured out what it does. Um, it's not involved in binding to red cells, but there's a lot more MSP3 complexes on the parasite surface. Um, there's a couple of papers that suggest, Clara, that MSPDL2 is actually undergoing some kind of antigenic variation, and that not every shizon in a population will actually express mm -hmm. MSPDBO2. So maybe, do you think that the differential abundance might be due to something like that, that different aerosolites have different proteins being expressed? Maybe? Yeah, I've, I've tried to look at this whole level of expression type thing in, in the different knockouts, but I haven't been able to come up with anything conclusive, very conclusive, but it looks like if we um, knock out what was it, MSP DVL1, I think? MSP DVL2 is being expressed a little bit more, but that's, again, not, not something that we've been able to quantify and, and be able to say with a lot of confidence. Melissa? Um, with the, the DVL1 and 2 and the MSPs that are binding on this platform, can you compete them off with by supplying recombinant versions of each one individually? <coughs> or do they replace each other? Um, I haven't tried that, but they look... So the binding profile of MSPDVL1 and MSPDVL2 to MSP1 is exactly the same. Um, so that's quite interesting. We haven't looked at whether we can, we can do a competition essay. I was just wondering if there's a, maybe a loading pathway. Even Marizone, as they're exported, where one is put on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm un unable to comment on that. That could be, that could be um, an interesting thing to look at. So that's it. Um, no more questions, so let's just thank Rob. Thank you.